everyone. Thanks for coming to Stephen's thesis defense. Uh, I want to start by thanking the ichthyology lab and Stephen's parents for the food spread we have, the cheese theme, Stephen's favorite food. So hopefully no one is lactose intolerant. <laughs> um, I want to thank Stephen's thesis committee. So Mike Graham and then Mark Steele from CSU Northridge. And Mark flew up for the event. Thanks for coming along with Mia Adriani. And so Mark and Mia were PIs on an NSF project that Stephen's thesis was part of, so you'll be hearing about that today. And Mia was also kind of an unofficial advisor for Stephen, so it was great that she was able to come. And I'd like to thank uh, Stephen's family for coming. So his parents, Rain and Judy, right? his, bro his twin brother, John, and John's wife, Lacey, so thanks for coming. It's great. And, well, when this thing... All right, so a little bit about Stephen before he does his defense. Hopefully this will work. <coughs> All right, as you can see, Stephen has been a scholar from a very young age. Reading before he was one, a pencil behind his ear, and if you see, this book actually was very formative to Stephen's experience growing up. He basically lives his life still by these four things. Okay, they're the four essential parts of his daily routine. Peekaboo, dance, toot toot, he loves cheese, yeah. and smile. So let's see, is there evidence of this? Yes, to this day, he still plays peekaboo at every opportunity. You've ever seen him on the dance floor? This guy can cut a rug <laughs> to do the splits. <laughs> I wish I had these ears. <laughs> I'll just I'll watch that one. You just go to the next slide if you want. <laughs> That's totally fine. Uh, yeah. Obviously, a face like this tells you something just happened. <laughs> that diaper. And it's the same face he makes today. <laughs> So, and then there is the smile. Yes, he has an award-winning smile. He knows how to turn on the charm. Along with that smile, he also has a lot of style. <laughs> and he's had it ever since he was a kid. Look at that. I wish I could pull that off. Right? He's also, when he came to interview, I could tell that his parents had done a very good job raising him with proper manners. Etiquette. He came, he was dressed so nicely like this, and he was so proper in the way he was speaking. I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if he's going to fit in so well in this, you know, this lab of kind of degenerates that we have. <laughs> then the, uh, you know, a day or two later, I got a handwritten thank you note in the mail, which I think is maybe the only time it's ever happened with like a hundred students in some great document. And, and here it is. I kept it. <laughs> Dr. Hamilton, thank you for meeting with me. I like fish in your lab. Please accept me. And of course I did. <laughs> right. So a little bit about his academic record. Right. He's, he's kind of lives by the philosophy in our lab. You know, work hard, play hard. Um, and uh, you know, that, that comes through. You know, someone falling asleep there working on his computer. You know, seems the same way throughout his, his whole life. About his education. So his background, he went to the University of Washington. That's where he did his undergrad. And then he's been here, and for three years, he was working on this NSF project that I mentioned down at Catalina Island. He spent three summers down there. One time he spent about seven months straight until he got island fever and had to, had to escape. Uh, but worked really hard for us on, on not only that project, but on his thesis, which is a big component of it. He got a number of awards and fellowships. So uh, he's got a CSU Coast Graduate Student Award. He was an MLL Scholar Award. Uh, and then for the last year, he was a Sea Grant State Fellow, and he was with the Delta Stewardship Council and being exposed to you know, policy issues and kind of helping them with, uh, you know, uh, advance a lot of their agenda. Um, he was uh, really great teaching and mentoring and, and, and working with students. So he served as a TA for the subtitle ecology class, really helping with all the logistics for diving and for s helping students get their independent research projects going. While we were out at Catalina, he mentored a lot of the undergraduate students that were working with us on the project, including a number that did their own independent research projects, and he kind of took the lead in supervising them, as well as helping them get through to analyzing their data and 
was like putting it together for posters at some of the conferences and stuff like that. He worked as a tutor at the Monterey Bay Education Center, so working with st students maybe mainly through fifth through twelfth grade, uh, as a math tutor and helping them along. And he's he's really great at uh, at, wor at working with kids and inspiring them. Uh, Employment-wise, he currently has a job, so we're pretty much done here, I think, right? Like, I don't, if, yeah. I don't have to defend if you don't. Yeah, want me no, to. I mean, <laughs> that's so pretty much all we, we want you to have. Yeah, okay, so he's great. working with. Um, Stantec is a consulting firm. He's a water resources planner. And then before that, he had a number of positions where he was a fisheries technician working on salmon issues, salmon passing through dams for Tacoma Power, and then hatchery issues up in, in Idaho. So a lot of good background. Again, he was working so hard on his hat over there. Tagging gobies <laughs> and entering data that at one point his hand just froze permanently in this unfortunate position. You know, and it, it took us about six months or so before he's, he's back to, luckily you're back to normal again. A lot now. of PT. Yeah, yeah, that was, it was kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> All right, he knew from, you know, he knew from a young age that he was destined to become a marine biologist, spending lots of time in and around the water and in and out of the ocean. However, you know, there was some evidence he was a bit of a slow learner when it came to <laughs> learning how to wear proper exposure protection. I mean, he's got the, the fins right, you got the, the goggles, so that's good, but yeah. Got that part. Sorry, John. <laughs> Even as an adult here, his advisor is needing to remind him to zip up his wetsuit. But he's finally figured it out. Right now, he wears all the proper, even you know, sun protection underwater. That's good. Yeah. And he's logged over 500 dives, and he's, he's really, uh, really well experienced. Um, so let's finish off a few more, a few more sort of secret hidden talents, you know, that Stephen has that you might may or may not know about. Well, he's, he's a ma he has magician skills. There he is, little Houdini, finding his way out of uh, um, what's this little circus trap in. <laughs> skills as a circus acrobat. Here he was practicing his trapeze act when we were down in Baja. He's a five-star chef. Here I think he's just making a small little snack for himself. <laughs> noodle. He's a golf pro. He only gets holes in one. He's a bowling champ. Only ever bowled perfect game. He's a chicken fight pro, so be <laughs> careful. You have a knife over your hand. Terrible in this one. A more delicate, obscure sports like cactus wrangling. <laughs> be very careful. And this one, I think he was practicing for some equestrian event or something. <laughs> He's also a master cage builder. Here's some of his perfect form in slow motion. <laughs> You do have to be very careful, though, because those that are less skilled, <laughs> like his committee member, you know, you might get trapped inside the cages. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he's also, as I mentioned, he's really great with kids. Here's just examples of my own kids. You know, um, all the time we spent in Catalina Island, he was right there playing with them all the time. He was in the lab tagging fish, holding Sydney when she was a month old. Um, you know, he spent lots of time with, with Hudson. And, and I really thank him for, you know, uh, for all the attention that he, he gave them. Even we had a party uh, just a week ago. Steven was there wearing, again, the, the fashion, the style is coming through. You know, and before the party, Hudson said, there's a direct quote, is Steven coming over? He's my favorite. <laughs> so uh, I know I'm going to miss Steven uh, when he's gone, but I think my kids might even miss him more. So uh, thank you. And with that, Steven Pang, a truly unique individual, come on up and tell us what you've been doing. So um, thank you for, com for all coming today. I wanted to thank Scott for those really illuminating set of slides there. Um, and I apologize to everybody in the audience for that. Um, did the projector go? <laughs> you worked quite well with it, that is for sure. All right, so again, thank you all. For Thank you all for coming today. Uh, my thesis is entitled The Effect of Sex Ratio on the Reproductive Biology of Two Sex-Changing Fish. So I'm going to be focusing on 
Lythropnus dolly, which are on the left there, those are blue banded gobies, and rhino gobiops nicolsii on the right, which are black eyed gobies. So a quick uh, kind of overview, so I'm gonna provide some background information, and then at the end of that background section, I'm gonna provide some kind of overarching objectives for this study. I'm then gonna break my presentation into two parts. So the first part is gonna be talking about reproductive output, and the second part will be talking about life history traits. Uh, within those parts, I'm gonna go into my objectives again and talk a bit more kind of specifics about my hypotheses and whatnot, and then they're gonna be broken down kind of like you would normally find, methods, results, discussion, kind of key takeaway points, and then I'm gonna wrap everything up at the end with a conclusion slide. So, a bit of background information. So in natural population, size-selective mortality, and that's mortality that targets a specific size class or a specific size range, is pervasive in many marine systems. Gape limitation, or um, how big an individual can open its mouth, typically constrains um, the diet of predators to prey that can actually be swallowed. Fishing can also impart size selection when fishermen attempt to target the, the largest individuals in a population. And in the commercial sector, uh, this select uh, selective tendency is typically due to the selectivity of the gear, so a large mesh size or a large hook size is gonna preferentially remove uh, large individuals from the population. In the recreational sector, size selectivity may also be present if uh, fishermen are limited by the number of fish that they can catch in a single day. Um, by targeting the largest individuals in a population, anglers and spear fishermen um, are able to maximize their catch. And I did wanna take a quick side note here. While there are a lot of very talented fishermen, um, I wanted to draw your attention to the empty-handed gentleman in the back there, and I was kind of hoping that would actually show up a little bit better. Oh, there we go. So, clearly fishing is not, unfortunately, you know, for everybody. So just to, to really drive that point home, home here, here we have that same graphic I used on the first slide. So we have a commercial, commercial fishing vessel in the top left here. Um, and this time, size, select, uh, size selection is targeting the largest individuals in the population. So it's increasing the survivorship of small individuals. Now, I kind of wanted to shift my focus really quick and um, talk about the, the type of sex-changing fishes that are gonna be the focus of this talk. Uh, these types of fish are called protagonist hermaphrodites, so that means they change sex, they start their life as female, and then change sex to males as they get older. What this means is that the larger size classes are predominantly male, and this type of kind of sexual life history um, is most prevalent in species that exhibit a polygonous kind of mating system, so that's where males will spawn with lots of females at the same time. Uh, because of this type of mating system, uh, sex ratios in these populations are naturally skewed in favor of females. In regards to their mating and spawning strategies, there's a bit of variation. So some species aggregate to spawn, well, the, where, where there will be lots of females and males together at the same time. Other species are haremic, where that, which, that, you know, basically that means there's a single dominant male that spawns with a harem of females. And the size of this harem can kind of, it, it varies from species to species, but typically about three, three to 10 females per harem. And uh, the males for these, these haremic species, they'll typically defend kind of spawning territories from other uh, males trying to encroach on their territory. But uh, you know, what causes protogenous hermaphrodites to actually change sex? And there's really two major cues. So the first one are what we call internal mechanisms, and these are fixed cues, such as you know, absolute size or absolute age. So say there's a, a female for a particular species, um, she grows until 50 centimeters or something, and that's gonna induce sex change. There are also external mechanisms, and um, these are social cues from the environment, such as sex ratio or the, uh, the size of an individual relative to other members of its social group. So, on the last slide, when I was talking about haremic species, so again, haremic is a single dominant male spawning with a harem of females. Um, in this kind of scenario, when that single dominant male is removed from the population, whether it's due to natural predation or fishing pressure, um, typically the next largest female will change sex to become male. So especially for haremic species, there's kind of like a, a pecking order. You know, typically it's the biggest females that will be changing sex. And these two mechanisms, I wanted to say, aren't mutually exclusive. Um, often species will exhibit kind of some combination of the two. Uh, so earlier we were discussing size selective mortality and how that targets the largest individuals in a population. Um, but how does this type of fishing affect protogenous hermaphrodites? Well, if you'll remember, protogenous hermaphrodites change sex from female to male. So most of the large size classes are predominantly male. Um, and what this means is that this type of fishing, size selective fishing, is not only size selective, but it's also sex selective in the sense that it removes uh, males preferentially from the population. And what this leads to is really skewed sex ratios, heavily in favor of females. And this graph down here, so this is a, a, a figure of the gag grouper stock in the Gulf of Mexico, and I think this is kind of like the poster child for overexploitation and, and protogenous hermaphrodites. But to kind of break this down, so 
the, the pink dashed line here represents the number of females in 1978. The blue dashed line represents the number of males in 1978. So a pretty sizable female population, and then a pretty, this is actually, it doesn't look like it, but a sizable male population, because remember, um, populations are typically, in natural settings, typically skewed in favor of females. Um, and again, notice that um, uh, the males are predominantly filling out those larger size classes. Fast forward 14 years, so now the year is 1992, after uh, size selective fishing has been going on this whole time. This is now the number of females in 1992, the solid orange line here. Um, still a pretty sizable population, less than before, and, and they've kind of, uh, uh, they're not quite as big as they used to be. But now look at this green solid line here. Um, and this is the number of males in 1992, and the, the abundance of males has significantly declined. In 1978, males made up about 16 to 17 percent of this population. In 1992, males only made up about 1 percent. But so I've talked about skewed sex ratios, and I've kind of, you know, framed this talk in the context of reproduction and reproductive biology. So how do skewed sex ratios in favor of females impact reproduction in protagonists hermaphrodites? And I'm going to kind of cover three main scenarios that could potentially happen. So when the spawning period comes around, um, it's possible that females will just be able, unable to find a male to spawn with. Um, and I would expect this to be most prevalent for species that have large territorial sizes. Uh, another scenario is, and, and this would be more for species that defend spawning territories with multiple nests, uh, it's possible that the males could be stretched so thin that they're just unable to defend all of their nests from predators trying to eat their eggs. And then finally, the last scenario, say, um, you know, say a, a female is able to find a male to spawn with, it's possible that after enough repeated spawnings in quick succession, the male isn't going to be able to produce enough viable gametes to fertilize all the eggs that the females are producing. And this is what we would call sperm depletion or sperm limitation. And ultimately, all of these scenarios lead to a situation that we call male limitation. And that's really a, a decrease in the reproductive output of a population due to the lack of males or the scarcity of males. Um, and to clarify in the context of this talk, reproductive output is going to be referring to the number of viable eggs produced. So, you know, for example, for sperm limitation, uh, even though the, the eggs are still being released by females, since they're not fertilized, they're not viable, since they're not necessarily contributing anything to the population next year. So to help kind of illustrate this point of male limitation, here's a hypothetical uh, kind of curve. So on the bottom, we have x-axis here. So over here would be like a healthy uh, population with lots of males. Uh, fishing pressure starts and you get less males and more females, so sex ratios start to skew. On the y-axis here, we have reproduction, and this could be a, a number of different reproductive metrics. This could be like fertilization rate or the total number of eggs produced. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that healthy populations, reproduction remains high. Sex ratios start to skew. It still remains pretty high. Remember, uh, sex ratios in these populations are naturally already skewed, so this isn't anything new to them. And, you know, males can spawn with multiple females, and sperm is energetically cheap to produce relative to eggs. But at some point, there kind of has to be kind of a threshold, right? And, and this is kind of where those three scenarios that I listed in the last slide would probably kick in. And kind of this is, you know, this would be like the male limitation, the decline in reproduction due to male limitation. And it might, you know, it might not look exactly like this. It could be more gradual. It could be, you know, over here or over here. But I just kind of wanted to help visualize what male limitation might look like. So a uh, number of modeling studies, and this is just a few of them here, have, have kind of tried to examine how fishing might impact protogenous hermaphrodites. And a lot of the early modeling work suggests that um, protogenous hermaphrodites are much more susceptible to overexploitation than non-hermaphroditic uh, non species. Uh, while some of the more uh, recent work kind of suggests that if fishing pressure remains light, uh, protogenous hermaphrodites actually might do better than non-hermaphroditic species. So, uh, you know, the jury's kind of still out. Ultimately, it's, it's kind of difficult to unequiv unequivocally say whether they're more or less susceptible to fishing. With that said, very few empirical and manipulative field studies have actually examined kind of how sex ratio impacts male limitation, where that threshold, where that drop in reproduction might actually occur. And that's where this um, study comes in. So the big kind of overarching objectives for this talk, um, part one is going to be talking about the influence of sex ratio on the reproductive output of protogenous hermaphrodites. Again, I'm kind of curious where that sex ratio threshold is, where we would start to see that drop in reproduction. And then part two is going to be talking about how sex ratio and sex change influence life history traits. So for part one, reproductive output, we're looking at three major metrics. So we're looking at fertilization rate. So this would be the proportion of fertilized eggs in a population. So this is kind of hinting at that scenario of sperm limitation or sperm depletion. And I predict that as sex ratios become skewed in favor, in favor of females, we would see a decrease in fertilization rate. Again, after repeated spawnings, the male is not going to be able to produce enough viable sperm. 
Uh, we'll also be looking at total egg production. This would be like the egg production for a population. Uh, I also predict that as sex ratios become skewed, total egg production is gonna go down. Uh, this would be, you know, uh, could be due to, you know, females being un unable to find a male to spawn with, so they're not gonna release those eggs. And then finally, and this one's a bit more intuitive, we're gonna be looking at the number of nests in each population, and I predict that that's also gonna go down as sex ratios become skewed. I would imagine that when there's lots of males, there's gonna be lots of nests, assuming they all have one. When there are less males, there are gonna be less nests, so that one's a bit more intuitive. So, a bit about our methods. So like I said on my title slide, we use two species. We use blue-banded gobies and black-eyed gobies. Blue-banded are on the left here, and black-eyed gobies are on the right. They're both protogenous hermaphrodites, so again, they change sex from female to male, and they're a haremic species. So a single dominant male spawns with a harem of females. Uh, this varies between the two species. For blue-banded gobies, it's about three to five females per, per harem, and then for black-eyed gobies, it's about two to six. They're both territorial nest brooders, which means that the males have spawning territories and then a nest or nests within those territories that they defend. Um, the nests for blue banded gobies typically consist of kind of rocky crevices or worm tubes or snail shells. And um, I know this is not the greatest picture, it's kind of hard to see, I've, I've kind of circled them there. Um, but I kind of wanted to represent or present what they kind of, what they look like in natural populations or where we found them. So they kind of associate with these kind of vertical faces at rocky reefs. So, they'll find tubes or, or shells to make their nests in there. For black-eyed gobies, they typically associate with kind of the, or kind of at the interface between a rocky reef and a, and a sand patch, and their nests typically consist of a, uh, like a little chamber beneath kind of some sort of hard substratus, so like a big rock or a boulder or some sort of shell or something. Um, and how the, the kind of reproductive process works is basically the males will have their, uh, defend their nests, there's some courtship behavior that, come, that goes on, and the females will come in and deposit their eggs after which the male then fertilizes the eggs. And because they're pair spawners, it means that there's only one female in the nest at a time. But I did also want to make it clear that multiple females will lay their eggs within the same nest. It's just one female is depositing her eggs at a time, though. Um, we picked these two species due to differences in size. So the biggest black-eyed gobies that we really worked with were like 83, 82 millimeters. Um, the biggest blue-banded gobies, I think, were about 42, 43. Uh, but these differences in size and consequently differences in fecundity and territory size and nest size could all kind of impact how these species um, respond to skewed sex ratios, and they might respond differently because of, of the things I just mentioned. But a little bit about our study site. So we worked out of two harbors on beautiful Catalina Island, so it's out in the northwest, and northwest end here. And then we did our work out of the Wrigley Marine Science Center, which is a USC um, uh, education and research facility owned and operated by USC. And we did the vast majority of our work uh, out in Big Fisherman's Cove here. And you can actually see it down here. It's right in front. It's just kind of cut off. But these are the, the lab facilities up here as well. And before I jumped into kind of the nitty gritty detail of our design, I kind of wanted to provide a, like a high level overview of what we did. I think it'll make it a bit more, you know, a bit easier to understand as we're going through it. But the general idea was to build a bunch of artificial reefs out in Big Fisherman's Cove, Big Fisherman Cove, excuse me, Mark. Um, we then collected a bunch of gobies and put them on those reefs at varying sex ratios. So this up here would be like a balanced uh, reef with lots, of, uh, with lots of males and females on it. Down here would be an example of a, like a really skewed sex ratio, a, a population that's been under heavy you know, uh, fishing pressure exploitation. So we have a single male with lots of females. And the idea was to go back and check for nests or check for eggs, and that's gonna kind of be how we quantify reproductive output. So a bit more detail, so I also want to make it clear that um, the experimental design for both species, for both blue-banded gobies and black-eyed gobies, was virtually identical except for one small detail, um, and I'm going to go into that in a few slides. Um, but they occurred in different years, so it's not like the blue-banded gobies and the black-eyed gobies were on the reef at the same time. We did blue-banded gobies in 2016 and then black-eyed gobies in 2017. A uh, bit more about the actual design, though. So we built 20 artificial reefs in Big Fisherman, Cove. Um, you can see in the schematic down here, and then I kind of uh, outlined where they would be on the, the picture up here as well. We put 20 fish on each reef, 20 gobies on each reef, and these were densities that were representative of what we found out in natural populations. We had 10 sex ratio treatments, so since we had 10 treatments in 20 reefs, each treatment had two replicates. And then the sex ratios range from our balanced treatment of 10 males and 10 females all the way down to one male and 19 females. So that one male, 19 female treatment is our really skewed population. And then we filled out all the sex ratios within those, um, within those two. So we had a, a two male and an 18 female treatment, a three male and a 17 female treatment, and so on and so forth. 
Our reefs uh, were two meters by two meters, and they had a cage on top of them to prevent predation. Um, this was uh, to not to keep the gobies in, to keep the other fish in the cove out for the most part. And the picture on the right here is this kind of top-down aerial view of one of our artificial reefs. So each reef had four subreefs, and you can kind of see them in the corner here. So uh, the, uh, each subreef was made up of a cinder block, and then some small rocks piled in front of it. And the small small rocks were to provide some kind of like rugosity and interstitial space for the gobies to keep them happy. Now, so, you know, I was talking about quantifying reproductive output and checking for eggs. Uh, to kind of help facilitate that process, we, we put a bunch of artificial nests on the reef. So this is an example, and this is the main difference between the two species for the design. So for the blue banded gobies, we put these six inch PVC tubes, there was an end cap on the end of, uh, on the end of it on one side, um, that we affectionately named our tunnels of love. Um, and they would readily come in there and lay eggs. So this little sheet sticking out, so that's an acetate sheet. And since we can't really take apart one of these tubes to check for eggs, uh, we, we cut out these sheets, roll them up, and put them in there. Um, and the gobies would re readily lay eggs on there so that when we were going around and checking for eggs, we could pull these sheets out and look at that, look at the sheet to see if there were eggs on it. Made it pretty easy. There were 16 of these artificial nests on each reef. So there were four on each sub-reef. And you can actually see some of them here, these like white kind of white kind of tubes. For the black eye gobies, and again, this was the big difference, um, we used terracotta saucers for their artificial nests. So, you know, the kind of saucer that you would put under a flower pot. We cut one edge off of that and then just flipped them over on the reefs. And the black eye gobies would, the black eye goby females would readily come in there and lay eggs on the underside of those saucers. For the black eye goby reefs, there were uh, five nests per reef. So there was one in each corner and then one directly in the middle of all the sub reefs. So that was our general kind of design to kind of walk you through of how we set it up after the reefs were built. So we basically go out to natural populations, natural reefs, um, while on scuba, and we'd use hand nets and Nalgene bottles and a lot of patients to basically wrangle these gobies. We'd do that for 45, 60 minutes. Um, we'd all come back up on the boat and take them back to the uh, lab at Wrigley. Once there, we would determine the size of the individual using calipers, as you can see here. And then we'd also determine the sex of the individ individual uh, by looking at their external sex organs under a microscope back here. And we were able to tell if they were female, if they were male, or if they were actually undergoing sex change at the time that we collected them. Once we knew what we had, we released them out on our reefs. So again, 20 fish per reef and our 10 different sex ratio treatments. They were out there for four weeks, and uh, we'd go back and check for weeks, uh, check for eggs, excuse me, once a week. Um, so again, for the blue banded gobies, it was really easy. We just pull that acetate sheet out um, to check for eggs. For the black eye gobies, we just uh, flip those terracotta saucers over. If we found eggs, we'd go ahead and take a picture of them so that we can look at them later. And this is how we quantified reproductive output. So once we had all of our pictures, uh, we loaded them up in image processing software. So this is an image J, actually. So this is a blue banded goby nest. So all those little orange dots, um, our individual eggs. And this is actually a really, a really full nest. Not all of them were, were this big. Um, but for the blue banded gobies, we just go through and individually hand count them. So this is what the finished product would look like for one of those. For black eye gobies, their nests were considerably bigger. We had initially tried hand counting them, and it was just taking way too long. A big, and again, this was a really big nest. They weren't all this big. But a big nest like this uh, would take, was taking like upwards of four hours. So what we ended up doing, since we had a ton of them, we set the scale of the image with the ruler on the bottom, and then using image J, we'd outline the, the entire nest, all the eggs within it, and that uh, an image J would calculate the area for us. We then overlaid a one centimeter by one centimeter square grid on top of the nest. We randomly selected five cells and counted all the eggs within those cells. We then averaged those together to give, to give us the mean density, and then multiplied that by the area to give us the total number of eggs in the nest. So two things. Um, if you'll remember, one of the response variables I'm looking at is the total number of eggs per reef. So if we found multiple nests on a reef with eggs, we'd add those together. And then we also counted, since I was looking at fertilization rate, we also counted the number of unfertilized eggs that we would find. So all the eggs I've so shown you so far have been fertilized. They're these, this nice kind of like golden orange color. Unfertilized, egg could, unfertilized eggs could be pretty easily distinguished because they had this cloudy kind of milky white appearance. So if we found any, any of those, we counted those as well. A little bit about my analyses, though. So again, fertilization rate is the first one that I looked at. And fertilization rate is the proportion of fertilized eggs over the total number of eggs. So the, over the, the fertilized eggs plus the unfertilized eggs that we found. 
for this one, I didn't actually perform an analysis. I just plotted it against sex ratio, and this was kind of to, to help give me an idea uh, if sperm limitation was present in these species. For the total number of eggs per reef, and this was um, gathered using that, the egg count data again, I used a Poisson generalized linear model with an over dispersion parameter since uh, I was dealing with count data and I had a lot of zeros. Um, my main factor was sex ratio, and then I used the average male and the average female size at the time of placement on the reef um, as my covariates, and I used AIC um, to select the best model. For the number of nests per reef, and this is the number of nests per reef with eggs in it, I just performed a simple linear regression, and uh, sex ratio was my explanatory variable. So with that, let's get a little bit into the results. So just to kind of orient you with this figure, because I'm going to be using this a lot kind of throughout my talk for my reproduction results. So we have blue binna gobies on the top here, black eye gobies on the bottom. Put some pictures to help you remember in case you forget. Each dot here um, represents one of our reefs. We have sex ratio on the bottom, uh, except instead of sex ratio, it's labeled as proportion male, kind of the same thing. Um, so over here on the right side of the x-axis, so that's our 50% proportion male reef, so that'd be the 10 male, 10 female treatment. As you move less, uh, left along the x-axis, sex ratios start to skew, you get less males and more females. So, uh, you know, like this reef right here was our one male and our 19 female treatment. For this figure and this figure alone, You'll notice there's one, uh, one reef over here. We actually didn't have a reef with zero males. Um, I just plotted this specifically so that we can kind of get this mating function or this fertilization curve. Uh, again, fertilization rate um, is on the y-axis, so that's a portion of fertilized eggs that we would find on each reef. And as you can see, um, fertilization rate remained high for both species. For, uh, well, for blue binna gobies, it was 100% for all of our reefs. We didn't find any unfertilized eggs. For black eye gobies, uh, there were a couple reefs where we found unfertilized eggs. But even on those reefs, um, the fertilization rate still remained really high, about 80% or above. So for the total number of eggs per reef, um, again, same setup, sex ratios on the bottom, more males on the left, skewed sex ratios over here, and the dashed lines represent non-significance. Um, the total number of eggs per reef uh, did not change significantly with sex ratio. There was a slight upward trend in the number of eggs produced as sex ratios start to become skewed, but again, this was non-significant. For the number of nests per reef, and uh, this is the number of nests per reef with eggs in it, um, same setup, sex ratios on the bottom. Uh, the total number, of, total number of nests per reef did not change, change significantly with sex ratio either. Most reefs from both species had about one to two nests on them. So, quick results section, I'm gonna get in my discussion now, it takes a little bit longer. Um, so if you remember from the intro, here's that kind of hypothetical curve that I had proposed that is what, you know, male imitation might look like. Um, I predicted that, you know, fertilization rates or reproduction would remain really high, after which there'd be kind of this sex ratio threshold and reproduction would drop. And at least in regards to, to fertilization rate, we didn't really see that. Um, fertilization rates remained really high for both species. So why, you know, what might have impacted the results that we saw? If you'll recall from the introduction, so, uh, some protogenous species aggregate to spawn. So there's lots of females and lots of males together at the same time. And a lot of the previous modeling work that has predicted sperm limitation in these species has focused on aggregate spawners. And when you have lots of males together at the same time, the prevalence of sperm competition is pretty high. And what I mean by sperm competition is that essentially all these males are competing to fertilize the same amount of egg, right? So since releasing a lot of sperm uh, would kind of increase the chance of likelihood, it's possible that this type of mating strategy or spawning strategy um, encourages high level of sperm release early on in the spawning period. So you'd imagine if a female is coming through later in the spawning period and is trying to you know, release eggs and get them fertilized, if all the males have already depleted their sperm stores, um, you know, she's not gonna be a very happy camper. Um, so this could be some indication of sperm, you know, sperm limitation or sperm depletion in these species. By contrast, um, some protogenous pair spawners in the tropics exhibit a strategy that researchers have termed as sperm economy. And essentially what this means is males are able to regulate the amount of sperm that they release. So one example um, might be that a male will release more sperm if he's spawning with a female that's really large because she's you know, probably gonna release more eggs. Uh, by contrast, uh, that, that same male would release less sperm if it's a smaller female partner. And while these species exhibit a different uh, kind of 
the species that exhibit uh, sperm economy, they have a slightly different spawning strategy than gobies. So they actually, there's some courtship behavior that goes on and they rise up in the water column and then release their gametes simultaneously. And if you remember, blue-banded gobies and black-eyed gobies spawn in nests. The important thing is that they're pair spawning. Both of these, both my gobies and both these species that practice uh, sperm economy are pair spawning. So there's only one male and one female spawning at the same time. So while it's unclear if my gobies exhibit the kind of same phenotypic plasticity of, of some of these, uh, you know, males that are able to regulate their sperm release, uh, it's possible that that pair spawning strategy might kind of indicate why we didn't really see sperm limitation in my gobies. So we didn't really see sperm limitation. So here's the total number of eggs produced per reef again. Um, but what about male limitation? And, and honestly, looking at just the number of eggs produced across all of my sex ratios, it doesn't really look like that. It remained fairly consistent across all of our reefs. And I'm gonna argue, I think there were kind of four main processes that might have impacted the results that we saw. Right now, I'm gonna focus on two on kind of this end of the range where there are lots of males that I think might have limited egg production. So I think egg production could have actually been higher. And I know this kind of seems counterintuitive because this entire time I've been talking about you know, we're gonna see a decrease in reproductive output over on this end of the range, right? Well, if there were these mechanisms that were actually going on and they were, you know, reducing how many eggs could be produced over here, uh, we might have seen a trend line, you know, kind of more similar to something like this, assuming that production over here remains static. And this to me does look like male limitation, right? Um, lots of males, production remains high. As males start to decrease and the sex ratios start to skew, you start to see a drop in reproductive output. So, the first kind of mechanism that I'm gonna talk about that I think was operating on this end of the sex ratio range is male-male competition. So this is competition between male conspecifics on the same reef. To kind of uh, help try to illustrate this point, so here's that top-down aerial view of one of our reefs that I'd used in the introduction, or during my method section, excuse me. And uh, let's throw some fish on there. So I'm not including the females just because we're talking solely about males, but so this would be like a 10-male reef. And honestly, when we were setting up our reefs, I didn't really expect to see a bunch of males on the same sub-reef like this. I kind of expected to see something closer to this, where there'd be one dominant or more dominant male on each corner of the reef. So as we started collecting data, you know, I was kind of expecting to see at least four nests per reef, four plus maybe for the blue-binned gobies, because if you remember, they had multiple nests within the same corner. Um, and that wasn't what we saw. We were seeing one to two nests per reef for the most part, for the most part across all of our reefs. And I think that the limited number of reefs may have been due to big males suppressing other subordinate males um, from establishing their own breeding territories. And this is actually something that's pretty well documented in um, territorial species where relative size often determines the outcome of agonistic interactions. So my thought process for why this might have limited production is basically, you know, a limited availability of nesting sites could mean less places for females to deposit their eggs, um, which would ultimately, uh, you know, result in a decrease in total reproductive output. Um, and while it's unclear how many males were able to monopolize a reef, I do think it was more than one, since we saw a lot of reefs with two nests. Um, but beyond that, it's kind of difficult to say, since we weren't, um, you know, out there observing these species, you know, all of the time. We basically put them out there and, and let them do their thing. So another mechanism that I think might have limited uh, egg production um, when sex ratios were pretty balanced was female preference and, and female selection. And, Mate preference is actually something I've been dealing with firsthand these past couple years, unfortunately. Um, for anybody that knows me, um, I've been absolutely smitten with Scott since day one, and despite my best uh, you know, attempts at wooing him, uh, he's continually rebuffed my advances and instead preferred or selected his wonderful wife, Brianna. Um, honestly, it's probably a good call on his part. I can't really blame him there. Uh, a bit more seriously, though, um, female preference and selection. So. Uh, a lot of the previous literature suggests that blue binned and black-eyed goby females um, prefer to spawn with, with large dominant males, and this is irregardless of male density. Uh, furthermore, the polygony threshold model suggests that a female that uh, mates with a male that is already spawned, so a male that already has eggs in his nest, gains a number of additional benefits. There is an increased parental investment, so the parent here would be the male. There is a reduced risk of filial cannibalism, so that'd be where the, the male consumes his, the, the eggs in his nest. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, a big nest is just a, a pretty good sign of good genes. So if all the females are flocking to this single male, um, it's, not po it's, it's possible that not all of them would be able to deposit their eggs, and this would ultimately limit total, uh, total reproduction. Um, and this could happen for something as, you know, simple as uh, a limited amount of nest space or something. 
So, so far I've kind of focused on this end of the sex ratio range over here. Um, and, you know, I think these two processes were going on and might have limited production over there, we're kind of masking the effects of male limitation potentially. But now I kind of want to shift my focus to the other side of the sex ratio range. So again, sex ratios with few males and lots of females. And if male-male competition was really kind of limiting egg production on reefs with lots of males, um, I'd expect that as you move left along the x-axis and there are less males and that competition is relaxed, I kind of would have expected egg production to go up. So I kind of would have, kind of would have, kind of would have expected um, to see a trend line kind of similar to this, which is not what we saw. And I'm gonna argue, I think there are two other kind of processes going on, on at this end of the range that might have limited the number of eggs that we saw over here. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about is an indifference or an inability of males to, uh, to establish multiple nesting sites, um, and especially on the reefs where there was really only a single male. So right side, male-male competition is reducing uh, production. Um, on the left side though, you would think that when there are less males there, or there's only one male there, and they don't have to defend their spawning territory from other males, um, you know, there should have been, at least in, in my mind, more established kind of nesting sites. And, it's not really what we saw, and territory theory predicts that territory size should actually increase um, with a decreasing density of competitors. So um, this was kind of a, an unexpected result for me, um, especially for the blue banded gobies, if you remember that there were four artificial nests on each sub reef, and those were pretty close. For the black eyed gobies, I can imagine why you know, a male might not want to travel the, the entire two meters since there were artificial nests in each corner of the reef, because um, maybe that was just kind of too big for his territory size. But for the blue banded gobies, those artificial nests on that sub reef were only six, seven, eight inches apart. Um, so I was kind of surprised that, that they didn't establish multiple nests. And, and why they didn't still kind of remains unclear. It's, it's possible that they didn't think they'd be able to defend uh, all of their nests from predators. Uh, it's possible that they just didn't think the increased energy investment of caring for multiple nests uh, was really worth it. And it's, it's kind of tough to say. Um, but if males weren't establishing multiple nests, you'd expect the one or two nests that were really full would be like completely full of eggs, right? So um, lots of females, it would seem like most, if not all, would probably get a chance to deposit their eggs um, and really pack that nest full. And again, that's not really what we saw. I kind of touched on it during my method slide when I was showing you guys uh, the pictures of the eggs that we were counting. Um, we did see a lot of nests that were really full, but we also saw a lot of nests that had lots of room for egg deposition still. And I think that female-female competition might explain why we didn't see higher production numbers on this end of the sex ratio range. So similar to male-male competition, um, it's possible that reproductive output was kind of controlled by a few large dominant females. Um, this type of competition is, is well documented in haremic angelfish, where uh, dominant females will interfere with the um, spawning time of subordinate females, and this you know, ultimately results results in, in kind of subordinate females getting turned away and, and not contributing to the population. Uh, in this study, it's possible that uh, female uh, blue and black-eyed gobies weren't able to spawn. They instead just reabsorbed those eggs and allocated that energy instead to something like somatic growth or future egg production or sex change. So ultimately, I think these kind of four mechanisms that I've laid out for you may have been impacting some of the re results that we saw. And I did want to say that even though I introduced them on specific ends of the sex ratio range, um, I think it's very possible that a lot of them were uh, kind of occurring concurrently, and it, it really makes it difficult to disentangle kind of all the effects. Um, you know, it's entirely possible that female-female competition was also going on at this end of the sex ratio range. I think that was one of the big limitations of this study, is that since we weren't constantly monitoring them, we didn't get to see if there actually was male-male competition. We didn't see if there really was female preference or selection. Um, but you know, I think these are my best guesses based on previous literature and just kind of with some of the results that we saw. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a complex interplay, I think, between a lot of these um, that makes it difficult to kind of break it all down. But that kind of wraps up my reproductive output section. Um, so kind of the big takeaways, uh, male and sperm limitation wasn't present in either species. Um, I, and I think things like competition, mate choice, um, and whether a species like aggregates or pair spawns um, is pretty important when you're kind of assessing protogenous populations. To revisit my hypotheses here, I predicted that as sex ratios became skewed in favor of females, fertilization rate would go down. Uh, that was not true, it remained high across all of our treatments. I predicted that total egg production would also go down. Again, that was not true, it remained pretty consistent across, of all, uh, across all of our reefs. And then finally, I predicted the number of nests per reef would go down. And again, uh, that 
wasn't really true. It was consistent across all of our treatments. So that kind of wraps up part one. Now I want to get into part two that's going to be focusing on life history traits. Um, and this part is, is uh, considerably quicker, so just bear with me. We're almost there. So a bit more details. Um, we wanted to find out how the proportion of sex change changes with sex ratio. And we were also interested in how growth rates might be influenced by sex change. And I predicted that as sex ratios become skewed in favor of females, the proportion of sex change per reef would go up. So this is the number of females on each reef that would be changing sex. And I kind of thought this, if you'll remember from the introduction when I was talking about internal and external mechanisms that regulate sex change. Um, this is kind of hinting at that I think there might be some kind of external mechanism going on. Because external mechanisms are, again, kind of social cues from the environment, such as sex ratio or, or the size of an individual relative to other members of its social group. Uh, in regards to growth rate, I've uh, hypothesized that individuals that attempt sex change will have the fastest growth rates. And this would probably allow them to compete with uh, other individuals better, other males better once they, once they change sex. So a bit about the methods for this section. I want to make it clear. Um, so the methods from, or the data and the results that we're going to be talking about here were pulled from the methods in part one. Um, there was kind of one little detail that I didn't talk about, or two little details, I guess, that I'm going to go into more now. Um, but yeah, I just want to make it clear that the data here are using the same fish on the same reefs at the same sex ratios that we, as, that we did in part one. So we'd go out there, we'd collect fish, we'd bring them back to the lab, determine the size and the sex of them. And one thing that I didn't mention is that we tag them afterwards. And we tagged them with uh, a, two tags that allowed us to determine the size and the sex of the individual when we initially caught them and placed them out on the reefs. So that at a later date, um, we could figure out you know, how fast they were growing and whether or not they changed sex. So we tagged them with visual implant elastomer, which is this gel that we would just un uh, inject underneath the skin and then it hardens after a set amount of time. Um, so the bottom tag down here, so this is the sex tag. So since it's blue, it's a male. And that tag above it is a size tag. So this is a, actually a 23 millimeter male. So this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty small fish. So I'm assuming that this is one that Scott probably caught. Because if you'll remember, he's not really the strongest fisherman. <laughs> Been a great advisor otherwise, though. <laughs> But so once they were tagged, um, we put them out on our reefs. We left them out there for four weeks. And again, um, you know, during that time, we were checking for eggs. And that was the data that we used to get the results from part one. Uh, another thing I didn't mention is after that four week period, we went out there and recollected them. Um, once we had all of our recollected gobies, all of our recollected tag gobies, we brought them back to the lab and once again determined the size and the sex of the individual. And since we knew how big they were initially, and we knew what sex they were initially, this allowed us to calculate growth rates and, again, figure out whether or not they change sex. Um, so we had pretty good recollections for the black eye gobies. We were getting about 13 to 18 indiv individuals back per, re per reef. For the blue banded gobies, we were slightly less successful in the sense that we didn't really get any blue banded gobies back from the reefs. Um, there were a handful of reefs that we would get one or two fish back, a lot of reefs that we didn't get any. So for this part, I'm just going to be focusing on black eye gobies. So for my analysis, um, again, one of my response variables is the proportion of sex change per reef. So when I calculated this, males were excluded since they can't change sex. They've already changed sex once. Um, so maybe I'll just give an example. So say we got 20 fish back per reef. Uh, initially, five of them were male and 15 of them were initially female. Of those 15 females, five of them changed sex to male. So the proportion of, of sex change for that reef would be 33%. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that males were excluded from, from this uh, response variable. I performed a simple linear regression and then had sex ratio as my explanatory variable. And again, this is the same sex ratios as we used in part one. For growth rate, I performed an analysis of covariance where type of sex change was my main factor. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more um, when I have my results up. I think it'll be a little bit easier to grasp. Um, and then I used initial size as my covariate. So getting into some results. Again, these were only for black-eyed gobies. So same setup, sex ratios on the bottom, balanced sex ratios are over here, skewed sex ratios are over here, and then we have proportion of sex change per reef on the y-axis here. Um, so the number of females that changed sex increased significantly as sex ratios became skewed in favor of females. So less females are changing sex over here, and more females are changing sex over here. For the growth rate, um, and so this was where my main factor was um, the type of sex change. So 
This red bar here are females that didn't change sex, so we put them out there as females, recollected them as females. The green bar are females that were transitioning when we recollected them, so females when they were put out, and when we recollected them back, they were actually undergoing sex change. The orange bar are females that actually completed sex change, and then the blue bar are, are, are males. Um, and as you can see, the, the takeaway from this slide is that individuals that completed sex change had the fastest growth rates over this four-week period. Females that didn't change sex, uh, females that were transitioning, and males um, all exhibited similar levels of growth. So discussion. Um, sex change occurred, again, most frequently as sex ratios became skewed in favor of females, and this seems to indicate that sex range in black-eyed dobies, um, at least to some extent, is kind of governed by these social cues or these external mechanisms. And this isn't super surprising. A lot of temper uh, temperate and tropical species um, exhibit sex change mechanisms that are uh, based on external cues. Um, this suggests that black-eyed dobies uh, would probably have some way to compensate for skewed sex ratios and would probably be less susceptible to male imitation. Uh, than a species that only changes sex based on internal cues. And this is, this is what we saw in the first part as well. Uh, with that said, it's entirely possible that black eyed gobies also had some sort of an internal mechanism radi regulating their sex change. If you'll remember, the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but the way this experiment was set up, it's a little bit tough to tell. For growth rate, so females and males both exhibited similar levels of growth to transitional individuals, and this isn't super surprising for the females and the males. Um, large males are already established. Um, they already have possibly uh, kind of spawning territories. So they would probably allocate that energy instead of somatic growth, probably to something um, like defending those territories or possibly nest care or courtship behavior. Um, for the small females, if you'll remember, or for, excuse me, for the females that didn't change sex, um, if you'll remember from the introduction when I was talking about haremic species, there's kind of a pecking order within the harem, right? So the largest females are gonna change sex. If these are small females, um, it's not surprising that they wouldn't try to change sex, but instead allocate that energy to something like um, future egg production or something like that. Um, individuals, again, that changed sex or completed sex change grew the fastest. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting that transitional females actually exhibited growth rates pretty similar to females that didn't change sex. And this seems to indicate that there's kind of a burst in growth rate immediately following sex change, but not during the actual transitional process. And this burst in growth is actually something that's pretty well documented in a number of species. So this figure below is an increment otolith width profile of cylindrical sand perch. Um, for those that might not know, so otoliths are, are ear bones and fish that essentially have an isometric relationship with somatic growth. I'm kind of simplifying a little bit. But you know, as the otoliths get bigger, so do the fish. So this figure is essentially showing us that, so this is the timing of sex change here, zero days since check mark. Um, this is before sex change, after sex change. Growth rates before sex change remain relatively consistent. Immediately following sex change, there's, there's this really you know, large uh, increase in how fast they're growing. Um, and Walker and McCormick, who did this study, found that this kind of burst in accelerated growth lasts for about 30 days, after which point it kind of uh, tapers off and then declines. Um, and what this burst in growth does is it allows newly transitioned males to compete with other existing males. Um, and it also allows uh, them to establish dominance over other large females that could be thinking about sex change. So with that, like I said, this section was quick. Um, the kind of key points, sex change appears, uh, at least appears to be governed by social cues in black gobies. Again, um, there could be some sort of internal mechanism as well. It's kind of tough to say. And growth rates were highest for individuals that actually completed sex change but weren't transitioning. So as sex ratios become skewed in favor of females, I predicted that the proportion of sex change would go up, and I was right. And then for indi individuals that attempt to change sex, I predicted they'd have the fastest growth rates. And that was kind of true. I'll give myself half points on that one, since it was only the individuals that completed sex change that, uh, that grew the fastest. Remember, the transitional in uh, individuals um, grew as fast as females that didn't change sex. So to kind of wrap everything up, male and sperm limitation wasn't present in either species. Um, this seems to indicate sex ratio skew um, probably doesn't impact these species that much. They're fairly resistant to it. Um, and you know, I think a lot of kind of the mechanisms that I talked about earlier might have limited uh, or might have impacted some of the results that we saw, um, like competition, mate choice, et cetera. Uh, black eyed gobies exhibit a lot of life history traits that are similar to other protogenous species. So sex change is, is kind of governed by social cues, at least to some extent. And then that, after that sex change, there's an accelerated burst in growth, which makes them more competitive. 
And then finally, um, you know, I think that at least for me, kind of one of the takeaways is that these populations kind of need to be managed holistically when you're assessing protogenous species, you kind of need to take into account competition, mate choice, whether a species changes sex uh, based on internal or external cues, um, and other components of mating systems um, when looking at these species. So with that, thank you. I have a ton of people to thank. Um, first, I want to thank Mike Graham. Um, he's obviously a huge Gobi <laughs> enthusiast as well. Um, Mike was uh, super helpful when I was developing my methods um, and my analyses, and his, his methods class that I took with Jim was, was one of the best classes I've ever taken here. Um, I've been a huge proponent for it. I encourage everybody to take it. Um, it really helped me kind of move away from that kind of plug and chug mindset for statistics and really you know, helped me become a better statistician, um, ecologist, and, and just a general kind of, in general, kind of a critical thinker. So thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. Mark Steele, also known as Gobi Whisperer. Unlike my advisor, Mark is actually an accomplished fisherman. <laughs> um, he made a cameo earlier on in the introduction, so here he is with his uh, world record still at the time. We'll call it a world record still. 68-pound um, yellowtail uh, back in 1990, I believe. Um, also, not, an, you know, not only an accomplished fisherman, a longtime supporter of the elk grow thundering herd. Go herd. Um, but Mark has done so much work out of Catalina with gobies, and that's why we call him the Gobi Whisperer. I think he's been doing work out there for eight or nine decades now, so <laughs> long, long, long time, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but he's great. You know, when I was um, setting this up and working through my results and my methods, um, he was an absolutely invaluable resource. And one thing I didn't mention, so Mark and me are both PIs on a larger Gobi project that was going on at the same time that I was out there, and my male limitation stuff was kind of a subset of that. So. In addition to my 20 reefs, there were another 49 reefs that were going on, so that's why they were out there. So total, we had 69 reefs. Um, and the first season that we were out there, um, it just was like kind of bust. Like we couldn't keep fish on the reef. The ones that we could keep on the reef um, were just not reproducing. Um, and it was really cool kind of you know, seeing Mark and the other PIs kind of like work through potential problems and solutions. Um, so that was really neat um, being involved with that. Um, <laughs> I also have a lot of respect for him for putting up with me for three months straight for multiple field seasons in a row. Um, I do think my constant presence had an effect on him, though. Um, this was after our first field season on the island. This was only like three weeks in, and you can already see like a noticeable decline in his mental well-being. Um, yeah. Uh, but thank you, Mark. Um, you've been great throughout this whole process. I really appreciate it. Last of my committee members, and certainly not least, is my advisor, Scott Hamilton. <laughs> oh, I feel like I should have caught that during a practice talk. This is actually Olympic gold medalist and Olympic commentator, Scott Hamilton. That is really embarrassing. I'm, I apologize. That's incredibly unprofessional. Here we go. <laughs> so seriously, Scott, um, I've learned so much from you these past few years. Um, you were the first person to introduce me to Ms. Gall. Um, you didn't tell me that I was supposed to sip it until after I had actually thrown it back like a shot, so thank you for that. Um, also, I think Scott, you know, he had talked about my fashion sense, but really I think Scott has been the one that's really helped me kind of hone mine. Um, he's clearly <laughs> very well dressed. Uh, and despite all my jokes during the talk, you know, uh, he really is a, a great fisherman. Um, and I think he's helped me hone those skills as well. Here he is. Oh, shoot, that's the a, that's a wrong picture there. <laughs> There we go, he's, there he is with a slightly bigger one. Um, if you'll notice this time, um, it's me in the background that is the empty-handed gentleman, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but seriously, Scott, there are so many great educators and researchers in the Cal State system, and I really do feel so fortunate that I was placed in your lab. I feel like it's uh, you know, an experience that I don't think I would have gotten anywhere else, and you really have had uh, like a profound effect on both my development as a professional, um, and on my per, you know, personal kind of growth as, as a person as well. Um, you have the most disgusting work ethic of anybody I've ever met in my entire life. Um, during my subtitle ecology class, I had like 70 hours of like video to watch, and Scott was like, oh, well, why don't you just like do this and this and this as well? And it was like my second semester, and I had no idea how to say no to Scott, so of course I did it like an idiot. Um, <laughs> But you know, we'd be out on the island, and it's like 11:30 on a weekend, and you know, we're heading down to the bar because that's what you do in Two Harbors in the summer. And it's like 11:30 at night, and Scott's sitting there, uh, still like, I pop by to see if he wants to join, and he's still editing theses or proposals or writing grants and stuff. And I really do think it shows um, that 
you know, there are so many students in our lab that are, that are funded um, based off, you know, of your grants and stuff. Um, I think that's great, and at least in my experience, that's definitely not the norm um, for master's in marine science. So thank you, Scott, for everything you've done, seriously. Um, these past few years, you've been like a whiter, hairier, less muscular version of my dad, basically. So <laughs> it's been really nice. Um, with that said, I really do, I really do consider you a friend, and even though I know your uh, like professional obligation to associate with me is, is quickly coming to a close. <laughs> Uh, forever, <laughs> forever. I really do hope that we stay in touch. Um, and I think I honestly think our relationship can kind of best be summed up um, with with a quote from a close friend of mine. And the quote reads that this has actually turned out pretty cool. It's kind of like a beautiful butterfly has emerged from a giant turd. <laughs> and this was actually said by Dr. Scott Hamilton. <laughs> um, so a little bit of context. So this is when I first sent my results to Scott from my model. And because it was a big turd, the first draft of my thesis was titled, this, in the subject line, it was first draft of my flaming turd. Uh, the subject line for my second draft was the second draft of my smoking turd and then smoldering turd. And then by my fifth draft, it's become a polished turd. And since you've helped me put out this fire, Scott, and as a token of my appreciation, um, I wanted to present you with an authentic fire extinguisher <laughs> so that if you have any more fires to put out, um, Hopefully you can use this. And I'm assuming it's probably when Matt turns in his, his first draft. So I'm sorry, Matt, I love you. Um, but honestly, thank you, Scott. You've been a wonderful advisor. Uh, moving forward, the, the two other PIs on this, on this big NSF Gobi project, Will White, he's up at OSU. He's an amazing modeler. Um, he had some really, really good input um, when I was working through a lot of my results. Mia Adriani, who is also here, she gets her own slide. Mia is also. Um, a longtime supporter of the Elk Grove Thundering Herd. Um, she's also a great researcher that loves protogenous hermaphrodites as well. Um, me and I got a lot of face time, especially bow time. Um, and I always uh, you know, really appreciated bouncing ideas off of you um, and kind of just working through problems that we had. And also mad props to you for uh, you know, being able to tolerate me for, for 18 hours a day for three months straight. So it was rough, I can imagine. So thank you so much, Mia. Um, our field crew. Honestly, I think, I, I'm sure probably everybody says this, I think we had the greatest field crew ever. Um, Erica Nava, she was there since the beginning, um, and then she abandoned us for Mark Steele's lab. Um, George Jarvis was my rock. He's the only person in Mark's lab that's still doing blue and goby research. Um, Alexis Estrada was there since the beginning. Casey Banquet, Darren Ambat, uh, Catherine Scafidi, my U rockers, Tyler Jerome, Katie Nealon, Courtney Thompson, Kyle Moores, you guys were all wonderful. Um, I didn't complain once. Um, Maddie, Emily, Russell Doxis, and Griffin Shrednick were also, you know, helped me keep my sanity out on the island. I always appreciate, uh, always appreciated our, our debriefing sessions, walking back from the lab. Uh, Alicia, Abby, honestly, some of the goofiest, most fun people I've ever had the ple pleasure of working with, um, but they'd also, you know, crack down and do four dives a day and then go tag in the lab for six hours. So honestly, it would not have been possible without, without these people. Um, and now that I'm in, in Sacramento, in landlocked Sacramento, and I have to deal with 110 degree summers, um, it's made me uh, kind of realize that, you know, how great and how much fun these field seasons really were. And I think that was largely due uh, to these people out there. Uh, volunteers, Sam Ginther was a huge help. Matt Jew was out for like a week, which was great. Cody Dawson, Steve Cunningham, Lindsey Cooper, they came out at like the end of my second field season when like my patience was running so thin. And uh, they didn't complain at all. They were great. Um, Heather Cramp, Heather Fulton Bennett, Laurel Lamb, Aaron Jaco, uh, Kaylin, Zoe, June, Kenji, Amanda, Racine. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, this also wouldn't have been possible without you. The Wrigley staff, Juan, um, probably the only spear fisherman that could maybe rival Mark. He would give us free uh, slabs of uh, yellowtail fillets all the time. So I really appreciate that. But all the waterfront guys, Trevor Odin, Chad. Um, Eric, Gordy, uh, all the lab people, Kelly, Chase Puentes, Vivian, Vivian, Lorraine, Lauren Odin, um, they're all great as well um, and, and put, up with, put up with us for three field seasons. Um, the ML, ML, Ick Lab, thank you for bringing food today. Um, thank you for, you know, providing feedback on all of my presentations and stuff. I gave a practice talk two weeks ago and they very politely and correctly told me that it was crap for the most part. So uh, basically, this finished product that you see now is, is kind of based off of their feedback and stuff. Um, I wanted to thank my funding sources, the National Science Foundation, Coast, Moss Landing, UROC, 
Um, special shout out to Tara, for whatever reason, I'm completely incompetent when it comes to registering for classes on time. And she was always like so patient with me and would always help me uh, work through my issues. Um, finally, I wanted to thank uh, all of my good friends here, Matt, Cody, Laurel, Holly, Amber, Justin, Steve, uh, as we call ourselves the bro hort, it's the stupidest name ever. Um, but if it wasn't, uh, like honestly, I couldn't have imagined going through grad school with, without you people. It's, it's been really, really fun. And honestly, if it wasn't for you guys, um, I probably would have been done a year or two earlier. But it was totally <laughs> worth it, 100%. Um, I wanted to thank John and Lacey for driving up here, and last but certainly not least, I want to thank my mom and dad. Um, they have provided me with so, so many opportunities, and they've always encouraged me to do you know, whatever I wanted and, and whatever I wanted to pursue. Um, and God knows, well really anybody that knows me, uh, knows that I've done some really stupid things in my life. And they have always been there, uh, always supported, always loved me, um, so thank you. I, I honestly would not have gotten this far without you guys, so thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will uh, take any questions. No, no. Yeah, yeah I made up. Great talk, Steven. Oh, um, I was wondering if you think about the sex change that occurred during your study could have affected your results from the first part. Um, so, like, if the two treatments were to become more similar during the yeah. study. Yeah, 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 100%. Um, so, I left out a lot of kind of like the nitty gritty details, and this might be too much. It might be too much to get into right now, but I'll try to kind of go through it uh, concisely. Basically, the, the reproduction results I used was only for the first week. Um, even though we were checking eggs for all four weeks um, while they were out there, and that was our intention to use all that egg data, I only used the first weeks uh, because sex ratios kind of started to, to drift from what we desired, and we were losing fish and stuff, especially for the blue anchovies. So I wasn't really confident saying that the egg production that we were seeing in weeks kind of like three and four were really representative of the treatments that we had initially established. So if I was using all four weeks of data, absolutely. I think sex change could have totally influenced the results that we saw. Um, I think that would have been interesting, to, to, especially for a, a kind of pulse experiment like this, to see how these populations would kind of rebound and respond. Um, but since they were only out there for a week, there's some evidence that blue manicomies can change sex in as little as three days. I don't think it's super common. Um, you know, they kind of already have to be, uh, uh, have a, a male kind of bias in their, uh, in their adult tissue. Um, but yeah, if, if we had used all four weeks of data, absolutely. So could you, have you looked at your uh, right, reproductive output relative to the sex ratio and factored in the size of the female? So, yeah, so so that was one of my covariates in the model was it was just average female size. I didn't look at all, um, each individual female. Um, and we tried, when we were setting up these treatments, we tried to have kind of a, a similar level of size, an average similar level of size across all of our treatments. Um, that wasn't true for some of the big treatments for some of the males. Um, since there was like only one male, um, there would be some really big females on the reef, so we had to have like a huge honker of a male to kind of establish his dominance. Um, but beyond that, you know, we tried to, to keep female size relatively consistent across all our treatments. So is that it for questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Margo. So, so it's interesting. How can they pull it off after they change sex? Yeah, what are they foregoing? Yeah. Well, see, and this is like, you know, when I was talking about limitations of the study since we weren't observing them, you know, I wonder if they would, if there would be like a period where they would uh, kind of avoid agonistic interactions or trying to establish dominance instead to allocate that energy to somatic growth. Um, but yeah, I, I do, 
I do think it is interesting because there was like a sizable increase in growth rate. That would be the only thing that I could think of is they're not immediately following sex change. They're not trying to establish territories and court females and stuff. Um, but I'm not sure how long after a sex change those behaviors would start to kick in again. But that would be, that would be my guess. What do you think? You're the Gobi whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So do you, do you think you're, there are some sort of commonly fish species that your results apply to? Like those fish species have very similar sorts of main systems of life as trees and yours? Or do you think you're building kind of unique and results you don't have any need to use? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a good question. Honestly, not really. Um, in, I also think I didn't really touch on this during my discussion, but I, th I think their kind of nest breeding strategy um, also impacted the results that we saw. And I, I think that makes it hard to kind of like scale it up to some other commercially and recreationally important fish. Um, if it is just pair spawning, if nest breeding didn't have anything to do with it, um, yeah, I mean, red grouper pair spawn, and, and they've actually been shown to, like in previous studies, um, be like slightly or less susceptible to kind of speed sex ratios and stuff. They kind of maintain their reproductive output. Um, but uh, yeah, I, again, I think it's, it's really tough to say without kind of taking into context all of the different components of a mating system for a species uh, when you're kind of assessing them. But yeah, I think it is, I think it is possible. Um, but I, I think you definitely have to kind of take it with a grain of salt and try to scale things up for sure for these gobies. Any other questions? So with the um, with the spawn breeders, obviously they have a spawning season. But they don't have for the everyday spawners? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but for the heroic ones, is it just year round type of thing? So that way you can do it during the summer and not have different results as opposed to in the spring or winter? Yeah, it depends. I mean, some species breed year round, like blue banded gobies breed year round, although we tried to get them up and going in winter one time and we weren't super successful. Um, black eyed gobies do have seasons, but if the water remains warm enough, they can kind of breed year round. So again, it's like one of those kind of species. There are some species, some pair spawners that, that kind of breed year round, but aggregate spawners typically do have kind of defined spawning periods. Yeah. All right, well, Steven's committee needs to take him to the back room, grill him just a little bit more. You guys enjoy the food, and we'll have him back shortly. Let's congratulate